uh, I mean, I, I want to give you a bit of cred here, because, because. No, no, you, no, no, no. Okay, on, go ahead. Hang on. Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, y you know so much about this, this, this web thing, right? And I think it's important that people actually understand what shaped you. Okay, how did you get to being this oracle of of the web, oracle. right? So I want to I want to talk about a, a couple things. Uh, Are you gonna ask me to? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna ask you to whatever. Okay. You once took the Trans Siberian Railway. I did indeed. In yeah. 1993. That's, That's right. 19 for you millennials out there, not 2093. <laughs> 1993. What? What was your takeaway from that experience? Mm. I had uh, studied uh, in an exchange program at Cambridge University in 88, and I backpacked around Europe, and I met this Aussie guy who had been traveling for four plus years around the world. And he literally unscrewed the top of my skull, mm -hmm. took a soldering iron to my brain, and completely changed the trajectory of my life. I wish I had stayed in touch with this guy. He told me two things. One is, he was broke as, uh -huh. and he just worked, traveled, worked, traveled, just laid the railroad tracks in front of him as he went. Second was, he was afraid of flying. He had this fear of flying, so he had done the entire trip, and he was only two-thirds of the way through by boat or land. And I was like, that's impossible. Like, And he's like, no, mate, it's simple. There's hundreds of countries and territories. There's only four trips. Think about the world as a silhouette. First trip, North South America. It's all connected, right? Right. Second trip, Europe, Asia. Third trip, Africa. Fourth trip, Australia. And he's like, if you're really, you know, crazy, you can do Antarctica, right? right? And I was like, oh, like that's like accessible and like exciting and adventurous and like, you know. And he's like, mate, you can see and hear when you do overland. It's nice, slow, and you can feel it. But more importantly, mate, you can smell it. You can smell the world. And I was, I remember being like. <gasps> I want to smell the world, wow. right? And I'm actually thinking of making like a graphic novel. It's called like Smell the World, right? So I was like, I was like, oh my God, I am. And I remember like telling my parents, I'm going to do that. And they were like, oh, okay, right? So I spent four years of my life travel, working my way around the world. Uh -huh. I was a bartender in the Virgin Islands. I was a ski bum in Switzerland. I picked grapes in France. I was an English teacher in Prague. I lived in a fishing village in Norway. Wow. I uh, worked wow, at the wow. BMW factory in Germany. Nice. Um, and then I went overland from Switzerland to Hong Kong by a hitchhike to Prague and then took the train Prague, Ukraine, Moscow, Siberia, Mongolia, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong. And that was the intention. Like, let's do a nice slow overland trip. And you can see people's, you know, uh, uh, like faces and language and food and architecture and landscape just like slowly changing. It's just, it's wonderful, right? And I didn't have very high expectations for China in 93. Right? I, I graduated from college in 89, and that was a seminal year. The wall falls in Berlin, and apartheid ends in South Africa. Same year, China takes three steps backwards with Tiananmen Square. Right? Right. And I was just like, and, and even besides all that, the 80s was the Cold War. Russia is going to destroy the world if Japan doesn't take it over. Mm -hmm. right? China wasn't even, China was a Peace Corps destination when I, was in, when I was in college. It wasn't even like this dynamic place. So I got to China, I was like, Oh, China is going to be amazing, like like Tang Dynasty China, mm. like like that, like ancient, you know, incredibly creative, you know, part of uh, like era in China. But I got to tell you, and I know that you know this because you grew up in you know in this region. It's like I we cross the border and like different gauge of uh, of train tracks. So they they literally you're sitting on the train yes. and they they jack up the whole train and then they take the wheels out from Mongolia and they put different set of wheels and like the, the train tracks are overlapping and then you go on a different gauge rail. And we got into China and everybody, all the Chinese people that were in Russia, that had been working in Russia, studying Russia, they all flooded the, uh, the food car, the food car in the back, right? Wow. And I gotta say like, the Russian and Mongolian food cars, not so great, right? But the Chinese food car, I mean, this is like, this is like- Get some tall fun, Early yeah. 1990, like, shitty train food yeah. but it was chinese food and it was amazing it was delicious right and i was like oh, i could s the dragon just <laughs> dug her talons into me and then the the dragon and i had two kids together and now we're amicably divorced thank you good night I'm like but i <laughs> I, yet, I, I literally yet. knew i smelled it right then right. like physically and spiritually and mentally and just like in my gut 
China is the biggest story of our collective lives. Right. World urban migration, GDP per capita, 70% of China was in extreme poverty back then, 30 years ago. You know what the percentage is now? It's fucking zero. Like I'm not I'm not saying it's like like a, a glib like zero. It's literally like when they near zero. No, no, no. Like that's the official number now of extreme people in poverty. It's so close to zero that they actually call it zero. So it's like 70% Three decades later to zero. Like if, if that's, uh, for extreme poverty, if that's not miraculous, if that doesn't show that whole GDP since Jesus thing that shows all of the, you know, collective industry and juice and, you know, just momentum in the country, then, you know, like that's what kept us there for so long because it was like front row seat at the show. You once rode a bike. Hmm. I don't know if you still own a bike, but you once rode... 4,000 kilometers. I mean, I rode 360 kilometers and I thought I was cool. But looking at this, 4,000 kilometers across Africa. It was that Aussie dude that had poisoned my brain. So I'm like, okay. Same guy. Same guy. And I was like, okay, uh, I did Europe, Asia. Uh, Australia is going to be fun. I haven't done that yet with the family. And yeah. um, my, I grew up in Medford, Mass, outside of Boston. And there's a great book called The Patagonia Express. Oh. Where the guy takes a subway from Medford, Mass to Tierra del Fuego. It's Paul, Paul Theroux, the he's uh -huh. foremost train travel writer. And I'm like, I'm gonna do that trip someday, right? But Africa, like overland through Africa, you get only two choices. It was truck or, or maybe motorcycle, but bicycle. So I was in Vietnam in, uh, after that Trans-Siberian trip and I got a hold of a 1942 Harley Davidson with a sidecar. And me and this other American guy were driving that around the Mekong Delta. It was really off the beaten path. We stayed and we slept in like a church, Catholic church. And, you know, and then we meet this guy riding a bicycle, a fake flying pigeon from China uh -huh. to Cambodia, 1,500 kilometers. Big Austrian dude. And he's like, yeah, it's normal. I slept in police station last night, right? And I was like, <laughs> what? And that blew my mind because I was like, motorcycle was great, but it was really a little too out of control, even for my adventurous taste. So I was like, all right. Bicycle, Africa. Did you buy Let's his bike that. off him and just? <laughs> I, I I ended up planning for two years, all during grad school uh -huh. in your, you know, uh, mom's home country of the Netherlands. I got my MBA at Erasmus, um, and Rotterdam School of Management. And I remember riding a bicycle along the canals on the canals while they were frozen and like training. And then I show up in Africa with two years of planning and this great bicycle and. It was just like entrepreneurship where you're like, I got this great idea and it's amazing and I'm prepared. And then like three days into it, you look yourself in the mirror and you're like, whose fucking idea was this anyway? <laughs> oh my God, I can't turn back now. 182 like, kilometers right? right? <laughs> and, uh, and then everything got stolen. I got wow. wiped out. I, I got like, like weeks into it, right? All this planning, all this like nice bicycle that I had. And I was like, well, you know what? Screw it. And I went to Zanzibar. I took the boat to Zanzibar. Um, and I rented a bike and I was like, oh, this works. And then I went to Dar es Salaam by boat from Zanzibar. Somebody gave me their bicycle. Uh, it, was it was a Belgian family and it was like a nice mountain bike, um, with like, you know, tw uh, uh, you know, 10 gears. Um, and a bell. Uh, and <laughs> it literally did have a bell because have streamers? It, it was their 14 year old daughter's bike. Oh my so God. I, I, I had to sit on the rack in the, my tent across it. Uh -huh. It was the only thing that I had left was my tent. And then I rode that all the way from Dar es Salaam to, um, um, Malawi. And then I broke it. And then I finished the last few thousand kilometers with the equivalent of a fake. Uh, like it was like a Pee Wee Herman bicycle with like mechanical brakes. And like, it was like, it was just like a one speed gigantic, you know, old school bicycle with the springy leather seat. Right. Yeah. And I rode that all the way to seat. all, all that, all the way to Cape town. Wow, right. That is and, uh, it was just, you know, it was, um, it was amazing. And it was awesome. Like, this is what I learned from, from that kind of travel is that most of life and it, uh, I'll look into the camera. If you're like, walk. Well, most of life is on this baseline. And then you're like, oh, it's kind of like pretty close to the baseline. Oh, I have a high, high, I have a low, low, but like, you're not really necessarily like, you know, getting, you know, the extremes. Right. Mm -hmm. But with travel, you can be like, oh, wow, like that is just amazing. But then also, you're, you know, I'm sick in like a border town in Mozambique for four days, right. you know, hacking my lungs out thinking I'm not going to make it, right? And like I went through four courses of antibiotics over those four months and four bicycles. But then the beautiful part is you want those high highs. You got to kind of bounce off the low lows. And then all the low lows, like it all kind of goes away. And then you get to keep all that cream in the top. 
And then you're like, oh, inner cookie monster say, me want more. I want more of that. Yes. And then entrepreneurship gives you that, right? Right. You can have that high, high, and low, low, like before breakfast, right? When you're like, we're going to be a, we're going to see, we're gonna see multiple deck of corn. And then you're like, no, we're, we're, your men are already dead. Like the first scene of like the matrix. And you're like, oh, and then like, oh my God, we just hired this great person. Oh my God, our CTO just quit to a competitor, right? And you're just like, that's all like, you know, all day, every day, right? But then you're just like, if you're comfortable with that discomfort, then you can get those high highs and low lows. And I tell people, you want to be an entrepreneur? You got kind of like three choices. One is just be an entrepreneur. Just do it. Just mm -hmm. jump in. Second one is, you know, join a startup, but like stay really connected to the founders and be like, I want to, I want to put in 60 hours a week, but I want to put in another 20 or more of like just being your like shadow and being helpful and like sitting in a board meeting or going to an investor pitch or doing other stuff. Like, let me pull the sled and like help prepare the deck. And the third one is if you're really young, like do some travel where you're just like really uncomfortable, right? And become very, very comfortable with that chaos, unpredictability and discomfort. And then you're like, oh, I wake up. It's all still here. You can't hurt me. I'm indestructible, right? It's like I get to choose. Right. And like, that's the whole thing about entrepreneurship or like when you're building this business, like you built across Asia Pacific where you're just like, all right, let's just, I'm covered in scabs and calluses and scar tissue like armor. Once again, unto the breach, here we go. Right. Yes. Just get back up, get back on the bike. Right. Yep. Yeah. Back indeed. on the bike, be or your trusty steed. being uncomfortable. Indeed. This is what I like, tell don't wish things were easier. Never wish things were no. easier. Always wish you're better. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the thing. Right. And just sh stop complaining. Shut up. Don't complain to yourself. Just keep going. I want to go into the final segment of, mm. uh, of this uh, podcast. The epicenter with Ronan Mintz. Epicenter. That's right. Epicenter. Rapid fire. Mm. You down? I'm not afraid. Can you do rapid fire? I'm not fire? afraid. Because you, hey, you... I'm not as stupid as I look. It's not possible. All right. That's good, right? Isn't that good? That is, yes, that is good. Yeah. Thank you. That, that one's good, so. too. That's so. If you weren't a serial entrepreneur. What? Serial murderer. I'd be a serial murderer. Okay. <laughs> I didn't have to ask the second part of that question. What, what color underwear would you Did, did you hear about that? They, they, um, uh, they found a, a whole bunch of people dead in a, um, a bathtub full of milk. It was a serial murderer. C-E-R-E. -E. Oh, oh. Thank you. Good. I have three kids. I have to tell three dad jokes. <laughs> three bad jokes. Yeah. Hey, we, we actually have a couple of people that like to tell bad, bad, dad, bad, bad, bad dad, dad jokes. jokes. Yes. The, in uh, no in the company. Um, so if you weren't an entrepreneur, what, what career would you be doing? Hmm. Tour guide? I don't know. Well, so it's interesting. So I love this book called Principles by Ray Dalio. Oh, my favorite book of right? all time. Right? Best. I best. read it. I hit, yeah. listened to the audio book. I read it, read it, it again. again. Read it and again. And I subscribe on Facebook. I subscribe on LinkedIn. So it pops up all the time. And like that guy, and I do transcendental meditation because of him. Yes. And um, I'm, I try to be You're radically meditator? open. I, I am. I've been doing TM now for eight years. Boom. And, I, and if I may, um, kitties out there in podcast land, um, that is the number one thing that I wish I had known when I was younger. I probably would not have heeded the advice, mm -hmm. but being able to give your mind a rest, just like, um, you know, you have to, when you work out at the gym, it's about, you know, you're actually like messing up your body. It's about the recovery when you get stronger. Right. So that, that, that ability to be able to regularly meditate, like that's a superpower, right? That's absolutely a superpower. Yeah, absolutely. But, but he has this website called principles, you yes. principles, Y O U. And it's a personality test, Adam Grant. And it's like, and, and, and if you ha don't have time to uh, read principles, he has this beautiful 30 minute video on YouTube, beautifully animated on YouTube. Yeah. Same animation goes into principles. You, and you take that personality test and it's MBTI and it's, you know, all disc and all these other ones that I've all taken. But it, it tells me that my number one, you know, sort of, uh, uh, like I'm an inspirer and an entertainer. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I, I think I, you know, I've been doing comedy shows now for 25 years, right? Like, oh, I would have loved to have yeah. been like a stand-up comic, right? Like, that's yes. that's what I would have loved. I remember your stand-up comedy uh, hours. Uh, chop Sticks was that was the name. Chop you know, Sticks yeah. in the basement of that pizza place. Uh, yeah, sure. And I moved it all around, and, and I did shows with Jardine you know, House in Hong Kong, yeah, Louis C.K. and Russell Peters and Mark Maron and Jim Gaffigan, yes. right? It's, that's my labor of love. So I think, yes. and and I MC events, and I'm kind of like a tech clown, right? Hey, you are kind of funny. You know that. Looking. Look, Thank you. Yes, Good night. Yes, yes. Um, what is your biggest investment regret? 
I, I think I think here here's the thing is that like I I think about like you know I remember walking around Beijing and be like wow that was the coffee shop that I met Fritz Demopoulos the you know most badass best foreign entrepreneur in China and he's like I'm raising money for this idea about travel at a three million dollar valuation and then you know it was sort of like Finding Nemo it's like Nemo oh that's a nice name right at the end there and I was like oh you're raising money it's like oh yeah that's nice but I I, I didn't invest I just didn't think of myself as an investor and then the company you know grows to 3.6 billion and it has this amazing exit right and I'm just like <laughs> Chunar is the is the, where to is a travel site right and I've just yes. and, and I've, I've had a few of those where I'm like oh that was the time that I, that was the place where I didn't invest in this and invest in that or somebody took me to a room mining Bitcoin in 2010 in Beijing right two thirds, three quarters of all Bitcoin mining was in China. Yes. But like, I, I also saw rooms like that, mm -hmm. which were full of 5,000 phones. Because back in the future yes. phones days, people would be rocking the rankings by downloading. P.S. There's still rooms of 5,000 right, right. phones. Right, right, well, More, and right? Mobile ad fraud is. So, is so mobile ad fraud, right? Like click fraud or download fraud. Yes. And you walk in, the windows were open in the winter and it's still hot. Yes. And I was like, I'm out. Yes. And I was like, what are you doing? Is that some sort of like simulation you have like a, something to download he's like no i'm mining crypto and i was like sounds cryptic to me i was like i'm out right and that's when like bitcoin was like pennies and like you could download like a few here, dozen give me a, a thumb drive i'll put five thousand of these on right? here and like and I, I walked away from that but here's the thing is like it's all like i think of it it's all like a giant it's like fertilizer a giant pile of shit all those like mistakes that then one beautiful little sprig can can like you know, grow out of. And like now I, I call web three, my act three. It's my third act. I'm, yes. I turned 55, you know, a couple of days ago. Happy and like, belated birthday. Thank you. And I'm back in it. Like I never, ever, ever, I, I, I just, I want to keep going. I never want to retire. Right. That's the thing about being a bike rider. You always get back on the bike, right back on the bike, right back on web two, web right, one, right on that mechanical horsey. Yeah. Three yeah. web five. We won't talk about that because that's <laughs> web two plus web three. Um, your favorite accommodation in the whole world? Oh. Not that hotel in Dharam Salam, wherever you were. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, you know what's interesting is that, like, my wife and I went to the best hotel in the world, like, two, like two of them. In two, Bali? Uh, one's in Bali, one, they're both in Indonesia, uh, one is in uh, Sumba in Nihi, uh -huh. right? And they're both voted the best hotel in the world. And uh -huh. during COVID, they were like, you know, 10% occupancy and 10% right. of the price. And they were, they were magical, right? They were, they were fantastic. What really, really made them magical was the fact that one was up in the jungle of Ubud mm -hmm. and one was um, right in this incredible pristine beach, the, the Nihiwatu in, uh, in Sumba. And I think back about my, my backpacking days and like just being in a simple tent mm -hmm. and like, but being able to go zip and then open it up and then you're just like by yourself in the middle of the, you know, the savanna in uh, Africa, or, you know, I'm in, you know, uh, a Corsica in, in, in France or whatever, right? So it's like, I, I, like, I think the uh, accommodation, like I love that, that flexibility and I wish I'd known when I was really even much younger how powerful it is to have a one-man tent and just be like, here I go. And just like, and you can just wake up anywhere, right? And like, so it's like, you, like here's the thing, the best things in life are free Absolutely, and that's waking up in nature and like you know, like seeing the sunset or the sunrise. The next best things are really fucking expensive, right? right. So use your resiliency and your grit and your like comfort with with discomfort when you're younger to like like get all the best things in life first, right? Yes. So. And you can still it's, do it. It's like age. the tent that's right next to the five star uh, hotel, right? Certainly, right? Yeah. You, you wake up, you still see the yeah. same sunrise. Mm. Your favorite movie? Hmm. I just rewatched Apocalypse Now. Oh. And, you know, I love the hero's journey and I love the heart of darkness. And it's not only just Apocalypse Now, but it's um, the, the documentary that they made about how uh, that, was actually, uh, that was actually created. So I think that movie is an absolute masterpiece. But if you actually see the, um, uh, the way that it was made, then you really appreciate it even more. My next favorite movie, same, um, you know, director is uh, the Godfather series, and it's just like that's just like I I can't ever 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 get enough of of Godfather. Wow, that's awesome. 
I was going to ask you your favorite book, but I, I think that's one thing we have in common. Principles, Ray Dalio. That's a, that's a fantastic book. You know, when I read omnivorously as uh, a backpacker mm -hmm. back in the you day. Had to, right? Yeah. yeah and it's no like, phones. The, yeah, some going to some youth hostel and you're just like scanning through and getting rid of like all the Danish and, you know, yeah. uh, other, other books there and like just find some like dog eared, you know, uh, copy, you know, from like, a, 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 it was like somebody in India, but it somehow ends up in like the Swiss Alps. And like, I, I think, I think just generally like, um, you know, I think it's really, really important to, to read. And I, I, I try to read a book a week and, um, wow. I, I think it's the most important thing you can do in your life, uh, in your life. Right. So it's like, there's so much incredible knowledge there and it's so easy kids to be distracted by bullshit things like Twitter and Instagram and the epicenter by Ronan Mintz. Ding. Don't be distracted by the epicenter. <laughs> but, Please but like, don't. but like reading and people are like, how, how can I read? Here, 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 here's the, here, here's the way to crack it. Right. Right. I got a Kindle. Yes. I got moon plus reader on my phone and I got an audio book. So I got all three of them cycling at the same time. Right. And here's, here's the math. Typical book, 300 pages, right? One week, it's 40 pages. One week. Easy, no excuse. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In 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 in, uh, in in one in one day, it's forty pages, right? Forty pages. Forty a pages. Day. And that's that's about forty minutes. Yep. I don't know, forty minutes a day. But but don't you right? Yes, and like, of course like you do. At the gym, in the bathroom, of like course. on on a thing, like to just snack on that. You don't even have to snack on one book, right? To just be and like before you go to bed, ten minutes, right? And then like in between things. So it's like 40 minutes a day and you just make it like, and, and you get out of that ridiculous cycle of just checking, you know, social media. But instead you're actually just reading a book every week, every week. And it's like, it's the best gift you can give yourself. It's just like meditation. You want, you want to go slow to go fast. Your favorite food. Favorite food. If we uh, have to order some, some food panda or some grab food right now, what are we ordering? You know, what's crazy is that I've spent most of my adult life in, um, uh, in Asia. Yes. But, like, you've got to go back to, like, what that comfort food of, like, of, like growing up. Yes. And uh, my dad had, like, an American diner. It was called Humpty Dumpty Donuts. It was a diner donut shop. Wow. And, like, that kind of, like, that, you know, like, I still, like. We have some donuts outside, by the way. Well, I mean, not, not so much donuts, oh. but that kind of, like, like the American like diner breakfast, yes. like that's just like, it gives, it, it's like, it's kind of like Ratatouille when he like takes that one bite of it and then vroom, he goes back wow. to his like, his like, um, you know, uh, like village ancestral home or whatever. Yes. Like for me, like the, like a big American breakfast, like it just feels, cause my dad would like cook it on Sunday morning and he would have like the, you know, it would just be like, it would just the smells and the whole thing about it. And it would just like, it really just fills me with like, you know, yum. warm. Yeah. My last question for you. Mm. Who is the most inspiring living person to you? Mm. That's a, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic question. I think, um, hmm. you know, I typically say, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, I've just read a lot about his, um, his life and how, you know, he, is lauded as this uh, amazing figure, but how, how ridiculously rocky and, you know, nonlinear his path was all, all the, you know, all the way to the very end. Right. And I, I really, I really appreciate, you know, that, um, what, what he did, you know, a really principled guy who was like, had a great sense of humor and brought in, you know, disparate people together. But I think, you know, right now, who, who is your modern day Abe Lincoln? Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, it right? It's a because tough one. It's a, it's a really, you know, and, and like, probably, are there great role models out there? Mm, I mean, t probably like under the spotlight, yes. like he probably wouldn't hold up so well if he was like under social media, like, 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 like nobody would, right? Yeah. Every, we're all canceled, right? Yes. But like, there are, there are a few people that I really, you know, uh, admire, like, one person that I just, I, I have a lot of admiration for him um, is Reed Hoffman, the, the founder of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, and he's just, he's like such a, a, a deep thinker. I had the pleasure of having breakfast with him once in, in Beijing. And um, like he's a very curious, very, um, you know, like 
thoughtful, deep thinking guy who just has like, you know, uh, a real, um, you know, really terrific, you know, reputation. And he's like, he's like, I, I think LinkedIn is a tool that's, that's changed my life in, in so many ways, right? I've gotten partnerships and hired people and raised money and found friends through that, right? I mean, I feel like if you're building a network and it's really important as an entrepreneur, like everybody you meet has got to be funneled in there because you never know five, 10, 20 years later, like that person, like, oh, wow, like that person I helped get a job, you know, she's now running that whole thing. Like, let's, let's do a deal together or let me be, let me be helpful there, right? So I think I'm grateful for Reed Hoffman for that, but also the way that he really thinks about things and mm -hmm. how he, like he's a big player of Catan. I don't know if you play Catan, Settles of Catan. It's one of the most popular games and I play it with my family all the time and it's, um, it's just a, a really terrific way to, um, think about entrepreneurship and I, I, I highly recommend it. You should be playing with friends or uh, you, you, even with your, your boys if you can. Um, and, you know, so he's got this sort of like in his Masters of Scale podcast is super, one. super fun as well too. So, so he, he's a guy that I just feel like, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a good person and mm -hmm. he's really, you know, done some, you know, like, like shining light, right? Either you're like, you know, adding or extracting and, you know, you're either like casting shadows or casting light. And I just right. feel like, you know, he's a, he's a, a, a net positive. For he's the a tool. spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. And you are a spotlight. Mr. Rich Robinson. You are a spotlight. Joshini. Ronan Mentz from the epicenter. Ding. I s <laughs> really appreciate you coming in. I really appreciate you, you asking. Thank you for being yeah. my first guest Beautiful on new three. studio. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Uh, that's what we do. Try and Love make it, it better. Nobody ever said that Ronan Mentz is messing around, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Rich Robinson. Ronan Mance, buddy. Boom. Thank you. That's Good a boom wrap. town. All right. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>